those these lightning talks are five minutes each. You'll hear a bell when it uh, when it is four minutes. So please wrap up then, and I'll try to keep us on schedule. And it'll be a, a hard cut off pretty soon after after five minutes. So we're going to start out today with Andrea Capozzo, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Milan Bicocca and a volunteer data scientist at Heart and Data. His lightning talk today is titled An Enriched Disease Risk Assessment Model Based on Historical Blood Donors. Thank you very much, Andrea. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen, and if you would do the same, we, you can go Thank ahead and start your talk. Much. Thank you very much, Levi, for your, the nice introduction. So I'll make my screen full screen, and I hope you can all see and hear what I'm saying. So. Um, Thank you very much, Levi. Today, I'm gonna talk about an rich disease risk assessment model based on historical blood donor records. This is a project um, brought together by Earth in Data team to which I belong. I'm gonna give you a little bit more details on who we are in the upcoming presentation and Avis Milano, that is the Italian Blood Donor Association. <laughs> to be fair, I could simply end up my presentation with this slide because the expectations about the models and the results that we wanted to present at EROM uh, was much higher, but then COVID-19 stepped in and the project suddenly stopped. Therefore, I would like to apologize for this, but today you won't see any R code or results. I will just present the team and the idea about the project, but I would like to keep you uh, up on, uh, on the nice features that we are about to develop for this project, and I hope you will agree on that. So what is Earth in Data? Earth in Data is a group of uh, data professional volunteers coming both from industry and academia, offering our passion and talents for social good. We have people and non-profit organizations to improve their service through data science and data analysis. We are based in Milan and we are active since May 2016. Our gold and historical partner is Avis, the Italian Blood Donor Association, with whom we have collaborated extensively in the past years. And particularly, you see here on my slide two uh, different projects that we have undertook, that we have undertaken with um, Avis. The first one on the left hand side is related to a marketing campaign to help Avis identify new potential donors in the city of Milan um, through a spatial model in which uh, the probability of uh, becoming a donor is different according to the different neighborhoods. And then on the right hand side, we um, have uh, worked on a project about D vitamin level in the blood donor populations to try to understand which variables affect its level the most, as we know that the lack of D vitamin is a um, really great problem in modern society. So what's next? and rich disease risk assessment model. Why do we need something like that? Well, because currently risk factors are assessed at an illness specific level. And you see here a chart about cardiovascular disease risk. And it's in Italian, but probably you can grasp the meaning. So the darker the color, the higher the probability of developing a cardiovascular disease. And here the population is split into two smokers and no, no smoker. And then you have age, uh, cholesterol and blood pressure level that are all factors that clearly affect the risk of uh, developing a cardiovascular disease. However, it has recently discovered in the literature that uh, these risk factors may cause the appearance of different diseases in different patients. Therefore, we would like to move forward these uh, illness-specific charts and build beyond the state of the art, a global risk assessment model uh, through the usage of Avis historical data. Avis has 10 year records of blood donations recorded both at donor specific and donation specific level. So we have clinical parameters recorded uh, both longitudinal and cross-sectional. And most importantly, we have donations dropout causes. It means that if uh, a donor needed to stop donating blood due to the developing of some illnesses, this is registered. And uh, what we would like to do is to make a comparison between the healthy uh, donor population that are still active donors uh, with the uh, population of former donors that needed to step out from the process of donating blood due to the development of some illnesses. Therefore, the project aims are as follows. Firstly, we would like to build an annual report on risk factors in the blood donor population. Then we would like, as I mentioned before, to enrich the uh, risk factors um, chart by assessing the uh, causes at a global level, incorporating 
not all, but some of the most common disease that modern society uh, encounter during the, its lifetime. And lastly, since it's going to be a probabilistic model, we would like to exploit its um, mm, uh, predictive power to prevent non-clinically evident diseases. Clearly, I haven't presented any result nor R code because I mentioned at the beginning I we didn't have uh, time, unfortunately, to to build up a model for this presentation. But we are actually in the process of data cleaning, so the model is going to be developed. And I would like to uh, ask you to stay tuned. Please do reach us out. Here you see our website and the website of Avis Milano, and uh, we would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Andrea. Okay. I'll stop Are... sharing the screen. Thank you I... very much, Levi. Thank you. I liked I liked your, your one result slide. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Um, our next speaker is Marco Calderisi, uh, who is the Chief Technical Officer at Code Solutions in Pisa. He's presenting to us a principal component analysis method uh, to detect biomarker captation from vibrational spectra. And Marco, I noted, has, has uh, done projects on a very wide range of topics from, uh, from forestry to environmental contamination and, and biomarkers. Thank you very much, Marco. Go ahead. Uh, good morning. Uh, and remember to turn off your video. Oh, yes, sure. Uh, Once you share your screen. I share my screen. Uh, share this one. Uh, okay, can you can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay. So, uh, uh, first of all, I want to thank you, the organizing committee, for inviting me and uh, you for listening. Um, this work was developed as a part of a, a research project uh, uh, involving uh, NEST, which is a, a, a research center where uh, people investigate scientific issues at nanoscale. Um, um, in Europe, uh, following a brain injury, uh, a CT scan is performed for about 80% of patients, but generally 70% of, of uh, those will not need it. On the other hand, about 20% uh, of the patient excluded at first sight would have been uh, positive if they had undergone a CT scan. Uh, so this is why we think there is a need of a nearly really rapid and non-invasive identification of your marker indicating of brain damage. Uh, so uh, together with NEST, we develop a lab on chip uh, biosense, uh, biosense resonator for the diagnosis of a TBI, which is traumatic brain injury, uh, by means of uh, a biomarker present in blood. Um, uh, this, uh, this sensor is uh, fully electrical, so it's portable, it's miniaturized, is a uh, Ultra sensitive and multiple marker, and uh, it uses some uh, machine learning algorithm inside. Um, we call it Breaker. Um, this uh, uh, microfluidic lab on chip is uh, fully based on the surface acoustic waves, and uh, the sensor signal stems from the variation of uh, resonant acoustic frequencies. They are also called harmonics. Um, but the fact is that uh, in common practice, the operator selects and analyzes one or few of those harmonics, but doing so, he or she introduces an operator bias. So a serious problem arises because the data produced by biosensor is subjected to the subjectivity of standard method to evaluate the pattern of harmonics. Um, as you may see, um, the spectra, the uh, spectra are acquired over time, and uh, the spectra correspond to, di to different experiments, but they are more or less uh, the same. It's very difficult to spot any differences by eye. Um, so uh, what we do, we, we, we 
use a very simple PCA to start uh, analyzing the signal. This um, because the standard method uh, causes also a massive loss of information owing to the discarding of the analyzed part of the signals. Uh, this novel method, uh, based on principal component uh, analyze, takes advantage from the whole harmonic data set and avoids any operator bias. Uh, the principal component analysis is applied to analyze simultaneously the full set of frequencies for all the experimental runs. Um, this is the analysis of output, the first analysis output. Uh, it's very clear that the two groups of measures belong to two actually different analytical sets. You can see these two groups. And um, uh, we also identify the most important uh, frequencies for the analysis and the, the report on the average spectrum by coloring it according to the importance uh, of the zone itself um so uh, we we did the the the, the experiment using gfat which is um, a very important biomarker for traumatic brain injuries and glioblastoma uh, at different concentration levels and uh, those are the results. Uh, the PCA method using just a PC1 uh, scores to do all the regression classification, uh, outperform classic method uh, regarding sens sensitivity and also for any of the harmonic that could be chosen. Um, um, we developed a shine application that allows to, to clean and explore the data by using interactive data visualization tools and everything. So uh, the takeaway message is that uh, we have shown that a simple method like PCA can make significant improvements to the sensing performance of molecular adsorption events. And that by using this unsupervised method, it is possible to avoid any type of bias due to the operator. So, Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Marco. Our next speaker is Mirko Signorelli, who is a biostatistician and R programmer at the Department of Biomedical Data Sciences of the Leiden University and, a mem and also a member of the organizing committee of this conference. So thank you very much for, for that, this wonderful, uh, this wonderful conference. Mirko is presenting to us PT mixed and R package for flexible modeling of longitudinal over dispersed count data. Good morning, Levia. Thank you, Mirko. And thank you for Good morning. sharing this session and for your help in the program committee. I will now unshare my screen. Okay. So in this talk, I will introduce a new R package called PT mixed. This package allows to fit a flexible mixed effects model for longitudinal data. And at the bottom of the slides, you can see a short link where you can find a copy of the slides that I'm showing. As you may already know, count distributions are usually divided into three groups, depending on whether their variance is smaller, equal, or larger than their expected value. These groups are respectively labeled as underdispersed, equidispersed, and overdispersed. In this talk, I will focus on overdispersed counts. Usually, over-dispersed counts are analyzed using models based on the well-known negative binomial distribution. However, there is mounting evidence that often this distribution is not flexible enough. For example, El Sharawi showed that the negative binomial does not fit sufficiently well the empirical distribution of count data that exhibit zero inflation or heavy tails. For this reason, they propose to use a more flexible distribution called Poisson Tweedy. This is a discrete distribution that has a third parameter besides the usual mean and dispersion parameters. This parameter is called power parameter and it allows to model extra zero inflation when negative and heavier tails when positive. In 2013, Esnaola proposed the Poisson 3D GLM that can be used to deal with cross-sectional data. However, a mixed effects model extension is lacking and this prevents the possibility to apply the Poisson 3D to longitudinal count data. For this reason, we have developed the Poisson 3D generalized linear mixed model. This model can be used to analyze longitudinal counts that exhibit different levels of zero inflation or heavy tails. And furthermore, we have created PT mixed, which is an R package that makes it easy to estimate this model. In short, 
The model is a GLMM where conditionally on a vector of random effects, the observed counts for a Poisson Twitty distribution, and the mean of this distribution depends on a vector of fixed effects and on subject-specific random effects. The computation of the likelihood of this model requires a combination of two numeric integration techniques. One, to approximate the probability mass function on the of the Poisson Twitty, and the other, to integrate with respect to the random effects. And the model can be estimated using maximum likelihood. For more details, I refer you to the article about PT mixed that is currently in press, and you can find a preprint of this article on archive. Now I would like to briefly illustrate the functionalities of the package. So let's consider an example data set where Y is the response, ID is the subject identifier, individuals belong to a treatment or a placebo group, and observations are taken at five consecutive time points. The first thing that we can do is to have a look at the distribution of Y with the PMF function that plots the empirical distribution of Y. And the next step is to visualize the trajectory of the response over time and across groups. And we can do that using the make spaghetti function. This function automates the passages needed to produce a so-called spaghetti plot in R. And as you can see, it is pretty easy to use because you only need to specify what your X, Y, ID, group, and data are. As a matter of, matter of fact, this is even easier than making spaghetti. And by the way, no, you don't need to cream to make good carbonara. After these exploratory steps, we can proceed and fit our model. This can be done with the PTMix function, where we specify the response Y, the fixed effects, here group, time, and their interaction, the subject ID, and the name of the data frame. In the package, I have also included some extra functions to fit simpler models, such as the negative binomial GLM and GLMM, as well as the Poisson 3D GLM. The parameter estimates, standard errors, and univariate wall tests associated to the estimated model can be uh, obtained with the summary function, as usual with GLMs and GLMMs. There is also a RANF function that computes the best linear unbiased predictor of the random effects. And finally, there is also the option to test more complex statistical hypotheses through a multivariate wall test or a likelihood ratio test. For more details about PTMixed, I refer you to the paper about PTMixed and to the CRAM page where the package is published. There you can also find a vignette uh, with a step-by-step -step example of how the package works. Here you can see the references that I cited during the presentation. And well, thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Mirko, also for the important uh, information for all the non-Italians that cream is not necessary in a carbonara. <laughs> <laughs> Still a conference uh, that should have been in Italy, so <laughs> just making the <laughs> remark. Yes. yes. <laughs> all right. Um, thank you. Our next speaker, speaker is Dario Righelli, a collaborator of mine in Davide Riso's group at the University of Padua, Department of Statistical Sciences and Dario is also a promoter of the Bioconductor Meetup Naples section. And today he's talking to us about differential enriched SCAN2, a package called DE SCAN2, which is in our pipeline for epigenomic data analysis. Thank you, Dario. Thank you. Go ahead and, and take it away. Just uh, to understand how to. Uh, ah, OK, here it is. Yeah, you're already sharing. Yeah. You're good. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Dario Righelli, and uh, today I'm going to explain uh, how my package for uh, differential uh, enrichment of epigenomic data works. Um, so the problem is to um, keep the differences uh, uh, between the different uh, conditions of epigenomic uh, data. So for example, for the attack seek supposed to have two different conditions, we use this TN5 transposon to cut the, the regions uh, where the chromatin is open. So after uh, the cutting, we can amplify and sequence the, the, the producer sequences. Uh, then we can map the, those sequences, uh, the, the, the short producer the sequences on a reference genome in order to produce uh, the peaks uh, for each of these uh, open uh, chromatin region. At least we hope to be able to do so. So uh, 
uh, our approach is um, a mixture of uh, um, of our of the steps that we developed uh, with our package here in yellow and other um, steps that can be made with other packages. Uh, first of all, we uh, implemented API calling in R, API caller in R, uh, then uh, filtering and alignment steps, and uh, third, uh, uh, matrix of the counts uh, for the peaks um, that is summarized in a summarized experiment. So then we, you can normalize the data and also integrate with other omics uh, if you have them. Um, so, uh, it is available on, bio on Bioconductor here since uh, the version 3.7. It has several big nets to, to understand how to use it. Uh, so, the peak color is uh, a Poisson uh, likelihood, uh, is based on a Poisson likelihood without a rate special estimation, and uh, it's a moving scan window over the genome, and uh, it compares multiple uh, lengths of the of the windows in order to uh, produce uh, a score for each of the peaks. Uh, the output is um, a peak file for each of the sample. And these files can be, uh, has to be taken from, uh, from as input uh, from the filtering and alignment step. Um, this is a very important step because it wants to replace the typical overlap intercept uh, intersection uh, of peaks across the samples. So uh, for the filtering, with, with the filtering, you filter out all those peaks with a very low uh, score um, detected in during the, 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 the peak detection uh, as a step. And the alignments uh, want to align the peaks across multiple samples. So uh, in the user can define this now, the, the, the the minimum number of sample where the peaks have to be detected. So in the end, we have a consensus, a list consensus of the peaks in form of genomic ranges. And we use this to construct a count matrix where on the rows we have the peaks and on the columns we have the samples. And uh, we um, uh, use this, uh, we produce as output a summarized experiment because we can also uh, preserve some other information, for example, some metadata on the peaks uh, with these, uh, in these row ranges uh, um, data structure. So once that we have a count matrix, we can uh, normalize the data as we do with RNA-seq data. Uh, and to do so, we can apply in theory, any kind of classic RNA-seq RNA normalization method. But as you can see from this graph, uh, as the number of samples varies and also the, 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 the normalization methods changes, also the number of detected peaks uh, in, in terms of differential enrichment of the peaks changes. So uh, pay attention to this step and maybe we are investigating if, uh, if it's needed to, to design some ad hoc uh, um, design normalization for this kind of data. Oops. Uh, finally, uh, once that we have normalized the data, we can do differential enrichment. To do so, you can use HR, DSeq, to NoiseQ, whatever package you prefer to do this. And also, if you want to, you can integrate with other kind of omics such as RNA-C comics. So here you have a volcano plot of the, uh, of the peaks. So the differential enriched peaks in red, they are the significant ones in, in blue, they're not significant ones. And here in this other volcano, you have in green uh, the, the annotated peaks with RNA-C uh, uh, data. So uh, genes in this. Uh, in this way. So uh, uh, if you have many samples, you can use also other kind of integration methods, such as mixomics, for example. So I want to finish by acknowledging my, uh, um, my collaborators, such as Claudia and Davide and uh, Luc Lucia and Nancy, uh, and all of you for your attention. That's it. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dario. All right, our next presenter is Garrett Innsberg, a freelance art developer in the medical and pharma sector. And Garrett is going to present a system to us for reproducible data visualization 
called Canvas Express. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for the intro. Let me share my screen. Yes, and just turn your video off once you're sharing the screen. Yeah, can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. OK. So my talk is about Canvas Express. Um, and what is Canvas Express? It's a library developed at uh, Bristol MySquip. And the core visualization uh, package is it's, uh, JavaScript package. Um, but there's a wrapper around it for R. So it's, in fact, an HTML widget. You can use it in Shiny and R Markdown, a Flex dashboard. Um, and it's, in fact, a very rich library. Um, yeah, it's portable. You can export and import um, charts developed with it. And what is special about it, I think, is that there's a lot of on-chart functionality to transform the data to cluster, to zoom. And especially one uh, aspect about that I want to talk about, and it's the reproducibility. So here you see a screenshot of a chart I've made. And if you right click on the chart and you get um, uh, this menu and it has a sub menu reproducible research. And this allows you to, to show the R code, the JSON code, how the chart is made. And it also has an option to reproduce the, um, uh, all of the actions you've taken after the chart has been created. Um, for example, if you want to change the color or uh, hide the legend. Um, and there's a couple of options to, um, to undo, undo the actions and to reset uh, the, the chart. I will show that now. So let's say my, my colleague has uh, developed this chart. Um, and I say, oh, it looks pretty good, but let's change a couple of things. Uh, this chart is about the top downloaded packages from CRAN. Um, so I've made it a bit bigger. And let's say I want to hide the x-axis on top and remove this legend here. Then I can do that by customize, hide the axis, and hide the legend. OK, and then my colleagues say, oh, how did you do that? Well, let's, let's show it. Reproducible research. And then I have the replay option. And as you see, it just replays all the actions I've done. And if you click on, on those steps, you get even more information about that. So this one is the set dimensions. This one is the um, x-axis show attribute. And this one is the show legend. Um, and you have to replay reproduce button here as well. And one more thing about this is that you can save the chart to a PNG. And the PNG does not only contain the chart, but also the, the actions you've done after you created the chart. So I've now downloaded this um, to a PNG. And let's say my colleague um, is working on the same chart and she wants to import it. So then I can just drop in um, my PNG and she can replay the actions that I've done. So I think that's uh, pretty cool. Um, yeah, there's, uh, there's other options as well. You can see the data that um, that is used to create uh, the chart. Um, yeah, and this is the this is the website of Canvas Express. So you can see all kind of um, examples of um, different different plot types. And um, the GitHub. Um, but that's basically what I want to, to tell you. And um, yeah, thanks, thanks for listening. 
and um, here you can see some more some more links. Thank you, Gare. I can tell you, I heard a lot. I saw a lot of very enthusiastic comments in the chat window while you were presenting. Very impressive. Okay, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> so you should catch up on the chat. <laughs> sure, we'll do that. All right, our next and last speaker is Liam Brierley, who's a research fellow at the University of Liverpool, UK, and an, and a Royal Statistical Society statistical ambassador. <clears throat> and Liam is talking to us today about open access data to derive genome composition of emerging viruses. Welcome. Morning. Thank you for that, Levi. Let me just share my presentation. Looks good. OK. So first of all, I have to say, ringrazio uh, gli organizzatori per avermi ospitato. I'm a research fellow interested in using data and models to better understand how new viruses jump from one host to another. And I'll introduce how some tools in R have helped us collect viral genetic information. Now, I probably do not need to convince anybody here that emerging viruses are important, but COVID-19 is certainly not going to be the last. We see new diseases emerge at a constant rate, so we urgently need better predictive models to understand what might be next. And we've had an exponential increase in the availability of virus genomes since about 2000. And while it's great that there's these volumes of potentially powerful data out there, a key challenge is how to effectively access and filter this data to help genomic predictions. And just to say, we're currently working with coronaviruses and their outer spike proteins, which are important for determining what kind of hosts each can infect. So that sequence curve I plotted represents NCBI's GenBank, which is a vast open access repository of sequences where the records are directly submitted from individual users. And as a result of this, there's great heterogeneity in their characteristics. So for example, some are linked to papers, some are unpublished, some are complete, some are partial, and so on. And metadata is often inconsistent. So here's a, a quite a good example. I've got three records here of a particular coronavirus affecting poultry from Brazil, Russia, and Spain, all from the same host, but the host field variously gives the scientific name, Gallus Gallus, the common name, chicken, or even a, a text description. And similarly, these records describe the same virus protein, despite using different terminology, S1 subunit, S1 glycoprotein, and so on. And the same virus species, despite having different organism IDs. So we need a more sophisticated way of searching, standardizing these data. So enter our framework using two packages from R OpenSci, TaxSize and R Entree. I'll actually start with R Entree. Entree just being a family of NCBI databases that includes GenBank. And R Entree has functions that can interface with these databases API. As such, it can cross-reference PubMed and other bioinformatics resources too. So I can search for sequences just using simple search terms. For example, the, uh, the organism ID using the poultry coronavirus that I just showed returns about 8,700 hits. I can then fetch to extract these sequences, which can be returned in standard bioinformatics formats like FASTA. And I can then get the metadata by extracting their e-summary. So the e-summary is just a special type of list object with much more feel earlier, for example, are these sequences complete or not? Now, from here, metadata can easily be tidied, filtered with whatever you prefer. Uh, in my case, once I automate the search and retrieval of all coronavirus sequences, I just use regular expressions on this metadata to filter down to complete spike proteins. But how do I make sure that I'm getting all coronaviruses to begin with? Well, here I use TaxSize, which queries repositories for taxonomies. Uh, a taxonomy just being a standard classification of how species relate. 
And I use NCBIs, but it can also connect to others for plants and so on. So I can identify all organisms downstream of the family Coronaviridae. This is much more reliable than uh, string-based searching. And I then further use taxis to resolve the variety of names in host metadata. So if I take that common name of the chicken, I can quickly get its organism ID. If I want, return a full classification to standardize to the species name. This gives us a reproducible standard data set of coronaviruses and hosts. Um, in sum, we've used this to identify about 6,000 genetic sequences of spike proteins belonging to 420 different coronaviruses across 189 different hosts. And this then allows reliable input data to predictive models, such as our work in progress machine learning, to predict host based on the genome composition of these spike proteins. And I'll just finish now with some take home messages. We're using open science tools to harness prepared genetic resources. Some challenges remain, for example, where the metadata is too large or uh, too mislabeled to manually correct. And programmatic solutions like this are really part of this essential task of looking beyond our current public health crisis to predict future epidemic threats. That's everything from me, so thank you. Thank you, Liam. All right, if we can get all of the speakers back into the, into the session here, then we'll start the Q&A period. And maybe while we're doing that, I'll start with the last question that came in uh, for you, Liam, which is... Oh, sorry, no, that... Actually, I'm confused about who that, that question is for. So I'll go ahead with uh, some of the collected questions that I already have. First, I'd just like to thank everyone for a very nice set of talks and for keeping <clears throat> on time and making my job easy here. All right, I'm going to start out with a couple questions, or, or at least one question for Mirko about the Poisson Tweedy uh, GLMM. There were a couple of questions. Um, the qu question was, how does the estimation of parameters compare to the negative binomial distribution requiring the the required number of samples you would require. And I had had a very similar question myself just in general about difficulty of convergence. And I, I had also been curious about the feasibility of adding um, empirical Bayes smoothing methods, which are common in, in biological applications. Yeah, so that is, uh, I think, a very relevant question. I saw that actually Federico was referring it in special to RNA-seq data, and it's also not a an immediate uh, questions to answer because it, in a sense the required sample size to really control the type 1 error depends on the scenario in which we're in. So if you look at the first work, the one on cross-sectional data of SNAOLA, uh, the answer that they made there was that you need about 10 samples per group. In a simple situation where you would have uh, two groups, you would need 20 cross-sectional samples. Uh, for longitudinal uh, data, this is a, the answer is actually a bit more complex. And uh, the general answer is it depends on which effect you are testing. We are actually we have actually in the article a section that is section 3.1 where we have simulations on these. And you see, for example, that if you test the time effect, already a sample size of 10 overall uh, seems to be enough to control the type 1 error. Whereas if you test group differences, uh, you may need more. So 10 samples. In that case, five per group is really not enough. And you may need to have 20, 25. But yeah, it's, it yeah. really changes a lot depending on whether the effect that you are estimating is confounded with the random effects in a sense. And so whether it's harder to estimate because of that, or if instead it's a parameter that doesn't really have to do with the random effects, so it's easier to estimate and uh, then the estimation is more accurate. And uh, yeah, convergence, yeah. Uh, if I have time, Convergence with the Poisson Tweedy is uh, generally non non trivial because of the additional power parameter and the fact that the PMF is not available in a closed form expression. So what you see often is that uh, if the sample size is very small, uh, you may have more convergence problems. And as the sample size increases, uh, the more you have convergence. So if you have a very small sample size, you actually may need to try different starting points before you can converge. 
And in our case, it also depends on the number of quadrature points. Thank you. Let's see. There was um, there was a question for Gare about um, using Canvas spec Canvas Express with uh, Trellis Scope JS, but I saw you already answered that in the in the chat that you will look into it. So that's right. I actually maybe I unless, unless you want to. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. I had a question for. Uh, a question for Dario about the identification of methylation peaks across samples. I was wondering if that had some, th some things in common with the identification of recurrent copy number across samples, such as is done by GISTIC and now in, in R, I actually a postdoc in my lab made the package C and D ranger for doing that for identifying overlapping regions of copy number across across samples in a population. Oh, that's a good question, but uh, we didn't need it, <laughs> but we can try to do it. Of course, we can take into account. So uh, we can we can we can see uh, if it works and how it works uh, and what has in common with other kind of data. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It seems it seems like there's something in in common there. Oh yeah, sure. I should say also I, I'm I, I can take any questions from the panelists for each other as well. Otherwise, I uh, I have a a couple more questions of my own here. Uh, I had a question for for Marco about your harmonic analysis and was wondering if if uh, I. I I'd imagine that Fourier transform would play some role in that. If, if that's something that that you you is is part of this analysis somehow, or could should be. Mm. Sorry, can you can you can you say? Uh, I just in 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 harmonic analyses and yeah. spectral analyses. I know Fourier transforms are sometimes used as a way to um, to identify. Uh, identify peaks or frequencies present in the data, if that's irrelevant to your topic. Oh, yes. Uh, well, um, the point is that the, the, the common practice is to for the shift in, uh, in um, main uh, spectral frequency. But what we think is that doing that, you uh, lose a, a lot, huge amount of of information. So we prefer to analyze the whole spectra and uh, to try to uh, let the spectra talk, we say, uh, in order to look for uh, which are the most rele relevant values of the spectra. So um, okay. in order to do that, uh, just do a very simple um, analysis of the logging plot and uh, um, look for the logging that are more, more informative in separating the uh, Classes or the more correlated to, to the um, concentration for the we're looking for. Um, okay, and I just saw there was a question also from the audience for you, which I uh, had missed, is whether your approach is extensible to ICA uh, with special reference to EEG analysis and any pros and cons with common techniques. Yeah, yeah. I think so. It should be, but uh, we haven't tried. Uh, we haven't tried because uh, we always look for the easiest solution. So uh, usually the first thing that we do is some exploratory analysis, or something. and as you know, the PCA is one of the most important things for doing exploratory analysis. And uh, if we get interested in the results with a simple and robust technique. Use that, and, and we like uh, also very much to, to, to use the unsupervised techniques in order not to introduce uh, any, anything from the operator. I think that if you use ICA, which is a, a very good and useful technique, you, you need to uh, do to do something. I mean, so and this is it's likely it's likely against the sort of a full auto, automatization. Of the, of the procedure. So uh, this is why we, we, we go 
for for this year. But anyway, we can also try to see if uh, we can look into the results we can see this. Thank you. I have another question for Mirko about uh, Optimix. And the question is, if, if your method is applied to RNA-seq data, does it require uh, pre-processing such as normalization and filtering? Yes, so this is another relevant question. And indeed, uh, the question is right. You need to deal with uh, these two issues, as usual with RNA-seq data. And we actually have a section in the uh, article, which is section 2.1, where we shortly discuss this. Uh, the answer about filtering is relatively short. You can apply the same filtering strategies that uh, you would use with any, with any other method for RNA-seq data, like, for example, a JAR or DSEC2. Uh, the next point is in the, instead how to incorporate normalization into PTMIX and more in general into a GLM or a GLMM. Uh, what you can do is to use one of the many normalization methods uh, that have been proposed. Uh, there is not much literature on how to normalize specifically longitudinal and any sick counts. I think almost all of the methods that I've seen have been proposed still when uh, cross-sectional data were the norm. Uh, I, I think nowadays still longitudinal and sick is not that common. So for the time being, you can use one of these methods. Typically, uh, here at LMC, we usually use TMM. And what you do from these methods is you get, uh, you extract from the normalization method the vector of sample-specific normalization weights, and then you include it into the mixed effects model as an offset. And to do this in the R package, you need to specify an additional argument that is called uh, quite obviously off offset. I didn't show it in the slides, but you can find it in the, the documentation. And it works like it would work with the GLM function, for example, in uh, in base R. Thank you. I, I had one question for Andrea about the these blood donor banks. And I was wondering if you were doing any follow-up uh, questionnaires um, or other uh, collecting of data from from these donors because I know that there's there's some some uh, controversy in the public in the literature about what levels of vitamin D actually result in long term health consequences and it seems like a, a good way to answer that although it would require a number of years of, of follow up. Uh, thank you very much, Levi, for the question. Yeah, actually, um, regarding the D-vitamin analysis, um, we were interested in uh, seeing which levels were the normal, let's say, in uh, a specific uh, uh, subset of the population, that is the donor population, because usually, like, blood donors are healthy people, so clearly there is, like, a sample selection bias in here, and therefore, I wouldn't think that to be generalizable at, let's say, at the national level, at least. Um, however, it, it was interesting to um, that that analysis was developed during a, a PhD thesis. So we have collaborated with a, um, a physician that was uh, ending his PhD thesis, and he needed this analysis to the blood donors. Um, but yeah, there is still, as you were saying, there is still a lack of complete knowledge about uh, the, the actual level of D vitamin because. Apparently, it seems that everybody uh, lacks uh, D-vitamin, and uh, I know that uh, in um, Finland or in, uh, in Norway, they have already incorporated D-vitamin in dairy products, for example, in order to uh, enhance its level. Um, on the other hand, uh, there is still uh, no, uh, let's say, agreement on uh, what are the consequences of having uh, low D-vitamin levels, and this is still uh, under under research, but yeah, sure, it, it could be uh, interesting to to follow up and to uh, produce uh, uh, further analysis uh, to to understand how this evolves. I think that's that's more interesting than rather than having just a snapshot on how the level is at uh, blood donor level. Thank you. Welcome. All right, thank you, every, everyone, very much for that. Was a great lightning session. I enjoyed all of the talks very much. Thank and, you. And. I look forward to, to seeing, meeting you again online or in person in the future. Okay, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much, Levi. Thank, Thank you. 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 Bye, guys. Bye. Bye, bye, bye. Bye. bye.